two chapters today, and that would be Horcruxes and Secumsempra. Yay, murder! I mean, straight up in both chapters, that entire discussion of Horcruxes basically states that, yeah, no, don't do this because it means you have to kill people and literally rip your soul to pieces. And then literally Tom Riddle is like, yeah, but could you do it more than once? I think what that is, is I think Rowling's hinting at the fact that he's already created a Horcrux. I think accidentally um, through the diary. I think the diary is the Horcrux he's created um, through the death of Moaning Myrtle. So I think what's happened is him sort of looking at it going, okay, I've done it once. C could I do it again? Could I do it more often? How about seven? Seven's a good number. Like, it's, it's a little frightening <laughs> how he, he logically works through all of this. And that's the key bit about the comparison. Like, of course, okay, we have this, this discussion about murder rips your soul, and then if you really want to, you could take advantage of that, stick that ripped soul into an object, and it will survive you after death. Followed by this face-off in the bathroom, in which both Draco and Malfoy and Harry Potter use some spells that they probably shouldn't. Harry comes out on top having literally just slashed open Draco Malfoy's chest. So why are we playing these moments off of each other? Well, one, of course, I think it's to point out the similarities that we actually are seeing between Voldemort and Harry. Not only is uh, Dumbledore is getting really frustrated and anxious to communicate to Harry that there was a choice made and that choice has changed things, but you still have options as well. That is to say that a choice was made by Voldemort to put some belief into this prophecy and that's changed how this is going to go because suddenly the prophecy is in play and not being ignored. But that doesn't mean Harry doesn't have a choice in how he reacts to it. And your reaction to it really is, like he says at the end of that chapter, all the difference in the world. And then immediately after this we have him doing something that we would say would be Voldemort-esque. Uh, and that is uh, using this cutting curse on Draco Malfoy. But there's a couple key differences between the conniving Tom Riddle we get um, talking to Slughorn in Slughorn's memory to Harry in this moment. And also I would like to point out to Draco Malfoy, and I'm going to talk about Severus as well. And the big difference is the meditation on it. That is to say that Tom Riddle really had this idea planned out, even if he did make that force first Horcrux with uh, Moaning Myrtle accidentally, he really does sort of figure out what he's done, what it means, and if he can do it again. It's not a regret of having caused this, but an interest in actually continuing it. And like Dumbledore points out, it's not that Riddle contained himself to the necessary seven murders to make his horcruxes. He killed a lot of people uh, and retained the horcrux killings to very particular people, which like I said is frightening. Compared to Harry and Draco's encounter. 
Harry is the furthest from Riddle in this moment, despite the fact that he seems infinitely close. Because what actually happens is Harry just shifts one of the spells that he's got in his head. Um, he tries a couple others first, and they're not working, and he just goes for the one that he's got in his head, which is Sencum Sem Sempra. And immediately, I mean immediately, upon realizing what he does, he runs to help Draco. The first thought he has after he sees what that spell does is, no. No, this isn't what I wanted. And he runs to try and help him. He doesn't interfere when Snape does, nor does he try and run away from the consequences. He immediately realizes he's made a major mistake and he tries to both fix it and atone for it, even at the same time that he's recognizing he can neither, neither fix it nor fully atone for it. He did not plan out the idea of attacking Draco. He was trying to track him down, he tried to eavesdrop on him, but the moment that he realizes he's crying. We don't actually know what Harry's gonna do in this moment. He could be thinking, okay, I just shut the door and I didn't see this. Or maybe now would be the time to confront him or comfort him. There could have been a lot of options from that point. Attacking Draco was not Harry's first option. It is in fact Draco's. But, like Harry here, I'm finding Draco's actions forgivable in the circumstances. Because we have it stated clearly that his life is at stake. He is in fear for his life of attempting to achieve the ends that Voldemort has given him. And he's scared. He feels like he's alone, he feels like nobody can help him, and that he is going to die. And then he sees one of his biggest rivals watching him. So just like Harry wasn't planning on attacking Draco, I do not think Draco was clearly thinking when he responded to seeing Harry in a way to attack. Just like with Sekum Sempra, I don't think necessarily Draco's one of his first instincts is to use the Kruviatus curse. I think again that was the moment where he's tried other things and he's shouting out the thing that first comes to his head. In truth, if you got the full curse out, I'm not even sure it would work. Like Bellatrix pointed out, you really need to have the intent to harm in that moment, and I don't think Draco's feeling it, simply because he's so afraid and frightened for his life right now, that that is what's pushing him to react, not an honest-to-god interest in hurting other people. So both these boys and their interaction together in the bathroom is really keyly placed following uh, Tom Riddle's discussion with Slughorn about Horcruxes. Because it shows that even Draco in this moment, while he might be on Voldemort's side, and even Harry in this moment, who might seem really similar, like the other side of a coin to Voldemort, that both of these boys are in a position that somebody else has placed them into. It is Voldemort's choices that have gotten to this point, but it is their choices that are key. More importantly, their choices that are meditated upon and then acted upon, not their split-second decisions when they are panicked. That is the key bit, because we can look at Tom Riddle and say, okay, everyone is capable of this. And then we can look at the boys and say, you see, everyone's capable of this. But Rowling is really pointing out a key difference with how meditated and just planned out everything is for Tom Riddle versus just the panic and fear that these boys are feeling. It's, it's a really interesting comparison between the three of them. And then I want to throw in Severus Snape. Severus Snape, of course, is one of the key... Uh, he's one of the three Lost Boys that would be Tom Riddle, Severus Snape, and Harry Potter. 
and he's always interesting to throw in here. He is uh, responding very quickly to this, um, not in his sort of roughshod way of doing things. Like, he immediately starts healing him, like, grabs him, and, and you hear him, like, he's concerned about scarring. Like, if we get you up to the hospital wing right now, we should be able to keep scarring to a minimal. So we do see some empathy in Snape in this moment. And then he ruins it by, um, not by the tensions. Like I said, Harry needs to atone for the choices he's made. Um, not even for demanding to see the book, but there are two key meditated decisions that place Snape closer to Tom Riddle in this moment than either of the boys. First, that is the invasion of Harry's mind, which is not something that you should do, because that takes away bodily autonomy just as much as the Imperius Curse does. That is saying it doesn't matter like what you think is private in your own, I'm going to take it from you. I have an issue with Severus using this on students. I have an issue with him having tried to use it on Draco. I have an issue with him using it on Harry here. Then the other thing is his very meditated and cruel decision in regards to Harry's punishment. And that is specifically to rub Harry's nose in evidence of his father and Sirius Black, who are both dead at this point in time. Sirius having died less than a year before this point. That is a meditated decision chosen solely to be cruel to Harry. And not as an actual punishment for the choices that Harry's made. McGonagall, like, giving him the smackdown in the common room in front of everybody and then saying, yes, I'm upholding the detentions, that's Yes, I agree with that. Even having him copy out these cards, I can agree with that. But specifically choosing the section which encompasses the loss that Harry is feeling right now, it is decisions like this that are going to turn people closer to the dark arts that Harry's just used, more so than away from them. And Severus of anybody should know that. So the fact that he is still making this decision, and again, it's a meditated decision, it's not a snap judgment. I have an issue with him. I can sympathize more with Draco Malfoy and Harry Potter than I can with either Severus or Tom Riddle. Tom Riddle is a lot further away, but there are moments like this where I'm just like, Severus, do you want to create another Lord Voldemort? Because this is how we create another Lord Voldemort. Between both Draco and Harry, both of these boys could go either way at this point in time. And supporting them is key, not making it worse. Which is something I also want to say to Hermione Granger. I don't like Hermione Granger in this book. And it's taken me a long time to figure out why. And that is because she doesn't do shit all. Straight up. Maybe I'm forgetting something she does at the very end. And that would be cool. I would like that. Except, up to this point in time, she's done nothing. She's literally, like, eh, about Ron. And then been very cruel in that as well. And complained about Harry using the prince's book. And been very cruel about that too. She has offered no assistance whatsoever in the grand scheme of things. And it's making things worse. Because even Ginny, who has had an Honest God interaction with Tom Riddle through a diary that she wrote to and got possessed from, has a better reason to be angry at Harry in this moment, and she maybe not directly defends Harry, but she at least comes in and says, like, Hermione, you need to shut up right now. Because Harry is smart in defending the prince. 
because Harry is right. It was Harry's decision to use that spell. The prince did not force him to use it, did not try and trick him into using it. The prince actually very clearly stated that it was for enemies. That should have been a clue to Harry that it was going to be a more offensive and dangerous spell. So blaming the prince in its entirety is not the proper thing to do. Harry takes it on, on himself, and he takes his poor decision on himself, and then all the good things that have happened because he's listening to the prince, he's, he's thanking the prince for. Like, his bad decisions are on him, but the good results are on the prince. And then Hermione again shows her prejudice. In specifically because he's become sort of this potions prodigy. Hermione, straight up, all of your information comes from textbooks. So you're doing exactly what Harry does, and yet you're expecting to be praised for it. You can literally recite textbook answers, which is exactly what Snape points out to you, and that's okay, that's the right thing to do, but when Harry's reading a book and doing well in a class, that's wrong. Do you see the issue I have here? Hermione's being hypocritical to a like major degree, and being pretentious as about it. It's the idea for her that if it's not exactly her way, then it's wrong. If it's not something she's interested in, it's not important, which is why Quinny Ginny tells her to shut up about Quidditch. Also, did you hear that? That was Quidditch and Ginny freaking Quinny. Oh god. I am just as frustrated in this moment as Ginny is, because Hermione, you're not helping. You're making things worse. And up to this point in time, you have been far more active in all of this than any of this book has showed. Now, I don't like Hermione Granger in this one. In fact, in this one I have more sympathy for Severus Snape than I do for Hermione Granger. Wow. Needed to get that one off my chest. Okay, so we are on our way to being done, and that's super exciting. So I'm going to keep reading, and I hope you do too. See you next time.